This is Bryant Myers, author of PMF, The Fifth Element of Health, and I'm really excited about this video because we're going to finally start talking about magnetism, and we're going to begin by looking at some basic concepts of static magnets. Many of us were exposed to magnetism at a young age with horseshoe magnets, bar magnets, refrigerator magnets, and many toys that use magnets. In fact, magnets are all around us. Computer hard drives, magnetic recording and data storage equipment, tape recorders, VCRs, microphones, headphones, loudspeakers, motors, which includes washing machines, drills, food mixers, vacuum cleaners, hand dryers, etc., all use magnets. Industrial lifting magnets, like the junkyard magnets, magnetic levitation used in magnetic trains, door catches and magnetic locks, magnetic suspension in your car and magnetic brakes. In fact, your car has a lot of magnets in it. Jewelry and bracelets have a lot of magnets. Of course, toys, games, puzzles, magnets are all over the place. Electric doorbells and buzzers use magnets. Scientific equipment such as mass spectrometers, particle accelerators use magnets. Magnets are also heavily used in industry, mining, food processing, glass and plastic, where industrial ceramic magnets remove impurities. In allopathic medicine, powerful magnets are used in MRIs, which is magnetic resonance imaging, NMR, which is nuclear magnetic resonance, and other diagnostic equipment. Now, in alternative medicine, magnetic therapy products abound, even at local drugstores. You can find magnetic products for just about every joint in your body. Magnetic belts and elbow braces, ankle braces. You can get full magnetic mattress pads, magnetic pillows, bracelets. You know, basically you can get little acupuncture magnets to work on all kinds of acupuncture points. Now we're going to see that pulse magnetic field therapy is more effective than static magnets, but before we can truly understand a changing magnetic field, we first need to understand what magnetism is. So with compass in hand, let's begin this exciting journey of the world of magnetism. The early Greeks found natural rock magnets in the area of Greece called magnesia. They called this magnetic stone lodestone. These are naturally magnetized pieces of the mineral magnetite, which is an iron oxide compound that can attract iron and other similar types of metals. The oldest reference to lodestone's properties appeared in 600 BC when the Greek philosopher Thales of Miletus noted iron's attraction to it. In fact, our term magnet derives from magnesia in Greece. Now, lodestones were used for navigation as early as the 1200s. In 1263, Pierre de Maricourt mapped out the magnetic field of a lodestone with a compass. He discovered that a magnet has two magnetic poles, a north and a south. Lodestone needles were placed on cork which floated in a water dish. The needle always pointed in a north-south direction, which helped ships to navigate their way. The Englishman William Gilbert, who was Queen Elizabeth's physician, was the first to investigate the phenomena of magnetism systematically using scientific methods. He also discovered that Earth itself is a weak magnet that was able to cause compasses to align themselves in a north to south direction. Now let's explore some basic ideas of magnetism that perhaps you've heard before. The poles of a magnet. A magnet when suspended from a string will align itself with one pole pointing north and one pole pointing south. The north seeking pole is labeled N for north while the south seeking pole is labeled S for south. This is essentially what a compass is. Now, unlike electric charge, which can be separated, the magnetic poles can't be separated. When a magnet is cut in half, it's found to create two more magnets, both having a north and a south pole. If you break the magnet in half again, you will have four complete magnets. Even when your piece is just one atom thick, there's still going to be two poles. And this suggests that atoms themselves are magnets. And we'll talk more about this later. Since a magnet's north pole is attracted to the Earth's magnetic north pole, the magnetic north pole must actually be a south pole because the north pole of your compass is going to be seeking a south pole. Likewise, the magnetic south pole must actually be a north pole. And also, we should mention that the magnetic north and south pole is about 11 degrees off from the actual geographic north and south pole. And this pole is definitely wandering by like 40 kilometers a year. And I did a separate video on how the Earth's magnetic poles seem to reverse polarity on average every 700,000 years or so. Now the core of the Earth is very, very hot, that the iron is not magnetic. The magnetic field is attributed to what's called the dynamo effect of the circulating electric current in the outer core of the Earth. The rotation of the Earth plays a part in generating this current. 
And of course, we're going to come back to how a circulating current creates a magnetic field. But for now, let's just kind of stick with the basic ideas of magnetism. The basic law of magnetic forces. Like poles of magnets repel each other, while opposite poles attract. And we all have an intuitive understanding of this from playing around with bar magnets. We know that two north poles will repel each other, while a north and a south pole will attract each other. And also two south poles will repel each other. Now we're going to come back to magnetic forces and quantify it more accurately with their Lorentz force law. But for now, let's just kind of get a basic intuitive feel for magnetic fields. Now we all have an understanding of magnetic fields from the little experiment of taking iron filings you know, we all did this in science class, and we could see the magnetic fields forming around a bar magnet. So those iron filings, they're actually showing you the actual magnetic fields. And the stronger the field, the more there's going to be more lines, what are called flux lines. Now, the vector nature of a magnetic field. When compasses are set in a magnetic field, they show the direction for which the magnetic field is acting. Magnetic fields, like electric fields, are vector quantities showing both magnitude and direction. Magnetic field lines flow out of the north pole of a magnet, and they flow into the south pole. Just like with electric charges, we had the electric flux flowing out of a positive charge and into a negative charge. Now, fields between attracting and repelling poles. Now, look at these images here. The field lines between attracting poles, which is a north and a south pole, link together while fields of repelling poles stay apart. And you can see the flows kind of flowing them apart. And this is kind of what you'd expect when you see these two repelling poles. Let's say you had two hoses. The water would flow out and it would kind of push out, kind of like that. Can you see that? So again, we can kind of use the water flow analogy to understand this idea of field flow and flux lines. Because magnetic fields are more visual and tangible than electric fields, it's a little easier to visualize the idea of a field as a mediator of forces than, say, the electric field, which we did in a previous video. So I want to conclude here with a geometric or qualitative understanding of the magnetic field strength or intensity in terms of flux lines and we'll introduce the magnetic quantity Tesla and Gauss. The number of magnetic field lines referred to as magnetic flux indicates the strength of the magnetic field and it's measured in Tesla, which is the SI units for magnetic field strength. Now, Gauss is also a measure of magnetic field strength, and one Tesla equals 10,000 Gauss. And we're going to look more at these units later on. But for now, remember that from electric fields that the greater the density of the field lines, the greater the strength of the flux. In the case, remember, here's this image from electric fields, that we had there's less flux lines coming out of A than B, so the electric field around B was stronger than A and the number of field lines, and the, or the density of them, I mean, actually corresponds to the actual intensity. So here's a little image of a magnetic field around a, a spherical north and south pole magnet, like the Earth. You'll notice that the field lines are closer together at the north and south poles, and they're further apart at the equator. And it turns out, like on the Earth, for example, the magnetic field is twice as strong at the poles than it is at the equator, roughly speaking. So let's take a look at some values of magnetic fields just to kind of give you an intuitive feel for magnetic field strengths with things that you can relate to. Now in interstellar space, the magnetic field strength is 10 to the minus 10 Tesla, which is very, very, very weak. It's almost zero. Now in mu steel chambers here on Earth, we actually can get the magnetic field down to 10 to the minus 14 Tesla which is used in squid magnetometers because you have to get rid of the background field of the Earth to really measure the magnetic field of the human body. More on that later. So let's talk about some magnetic field strengths of common objects. And I'm going to use Gauss instead of Tesla because it's just easier. And remember, one Tesla equals 10,000 Gauss. So the Earth's magnetic field averages about 0.5 Gauss, which is 0.33 at the equator, 0.66 at the poles. The Sun's magnetic field, interestingly, is, is only about double the Earth's at about one Gauss, and it's because the Sun is much larger, so the field is much more spread out. Now, low-intensity PMF devices, which I really feel are the safest and best intensities to use, are in the range of around 0.1 to 5 Gauss. Now, refrigerator magnets are going to be around 100 Gauss. Medium-range PMF intensity devices that I don't recommend, but they're still not terrible, are going to be in the range of, of 10 to 1,000 Gauss. And sometimes they use millitesla, just as microteslas used in low intensity. A good ceramic magnet, if you've ever seen some really of those strong ceramic magnets, they're going to have around 2,500 to 4,000 Gauss. 
the neodymium magnets, which are the, really the strongest permanent magnets, are going to be rated around 12,000 to 14,000 Gauss. Now, junkyard magnets, which pick up entire cars, are electromagnets, and they're, they're working in about the 1 to 2 Tesla, or 10,000 to 20,000 Gauss range as well. So actually, let's kind of go back here. So neodymium magnets are going to be about 1.2 to 1.4 Tesla. So we can kind of use Tesla there because we're getting high enough because the Tesla is a very strong field strength. Uh, so basically, neodymium magnets, junkyard magnets, MRIs, and high-intensity PMF devices are all within this 1 to 3 Tesla range, which is 10,000 to 30,000 Gauss. So for PMF, I absolutely advise against getting high intensity because think about it. If you get a 1 to 2 Tesla PMF device, that's the same field strength as a junkyard magnet that can pick up a whole car. Do you really want that kind of intensity pulsing through your body? I certainly don't. You can use these short term, but it's not something you want to use on an ongoing basis. And I strongly, strongly advise against it. And I've done a whole video series, which I'll put at a link below this video, of why more is not better. So we're going to keep coming back to this theme of less is more and why you want a low intensity frequency resonance PMF system. But in this video, I just kind of wanted to give you an introduction to what magnetic fields are, the magnetic force from a qualitative perspective, and just kind of this idea of magnetic field intensities and using everyday objects. So you can kind of put all these field strengths in perspective. And in conclusion, I do need to say that PEMF, or pulsed electromagnetic fields, are time-varying magnetic fields. So they are different than static fields, and actually they're more potent, so you don't need the high intensities because they're time-varying. And we're going to see why that is so as this course progresses. So thanks for watching. In the next video, we're going to take a closer look at the physics of the magnetic force, magnetic fields, and the true nature of magnetism as it arises in the atomic level and how circular current loops create the same magnetic field that static magnets do. So I look forward to seeing you in the next video.